Megan, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm so good. Thank you for having me, Melissa. Great to see you. It's my pleasure. Great to see you too. So Megan, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm Megan Webb from Sydney, Australia, and I'm an alcohol recovery coach. And that's through This Naked Mind with Annie Grace. Uh, I'm a mum to three kids and I work with children on the autism spectrum. So I'm pretty busy because I also have my own coaching business um, and single parenting. So it's all happening. <laughs> so that's yep. me in a nutshell. You've got a lot of things going on in your life for sure, as do a lot of folks. Yeah. Yeah. Juggling. Juggling. Yeah. What challenges have you faced with raising children with autism or working with children with autism? Oh, no, it's, um, it's very interesting. Uh, I've, so at my, the school I work at, it, the full spectrum. So we have some, you know, high needs and lower needs. And I guess some of the main challenges are that they can get quite upset when they're frustrated and that can result in some injuries. So, you know, and I think the other frustration is just wanting to understand them, but them not being able to communicate so much. So that can be pretty tough as well. And what are your biggest rewards? Uh, look, I think, I think number one is just knowing that you're giving the family and the parents First of all, well, really just someone else to understand and love their kid too, their children. Um, I think that's, that's the top thing, just working with um, the family or just helping the family and them knowing there's someone else in there batting for their kid as well. Um, and just seeing the, the steps that the kids do take at work, at school, um, however small it might seem to us, knowing how really how big it is for the child. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you for the work that you do. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's 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 really rewarding. It really is. It's um it's tough at times, but it's I would I wouldn't change it. Definitely. For sure. And you're also an alcohol recovery coach. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I am. So, I do you want me to go back and tell my story on how I got there? Sure. We'd love to hear it. That's what it, we're all about here. Let's hear your story. Yes. Okay. So back when I was a teenager at school, I was quite confident and I enjoyed um, getting up in front of the class and speaking. And, and then one day when I was 17, I got up in front of the class and I held the paper to talk, to read the notices out. And um, the paper started shaking. And it was that day that I... I developed a social phobia, so I couldn't speak publicly, like um, in front of people that are like the class. I couldn't eat in front of people. I couldn't drink in front of people because I would shake. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was an anxiety disorder. I'd already had, I already had a sort of very, um, quite severe underlying anxiety since I was a kid. So, but that kind of presented really in just a lot of worry and uh, destructive thoughts. So this shaking was something that just came out of nowhere. It affected everything because I had to hide that. You know, I didn't want people to know. So that was very difficult. So I was 17 and at that point I'd never had a drink of alcohol, uh, believe it or not, because most people, of kids of that age, had, um, but I hadn't. And then... When I was 18, I discovered alcohol and I discovered that I could stop the shaking with that, like just have a drink and, oh, look at that. I'm more confident. I'm not shaking. So it became, although I didn't just have one drink, I should say that 
straight away I had too many. So it went from the initial half hour of, oh, I feel confident and in control to I was just messy, you know, so. Now, were you still in school when this began? No, so this happened literally after, just after I'd left school. So we have in Australia what's called the HSC, which is our finishing certificate when you're about 18. So it's called Year 12. So that finished at the end of November. This is December that I discovered alcohol because the party started. Sure. And I was straight into it in a big way. And, you know, thinking back, I was thinking, oh, this is helping so much. But I just wasn't really realizing how stupid I was looking. You know, I was really drinking too much and then doing stupid things. I'd be better off if I'd just been shaking. <laughs> um, so that, that went on, well, it was self-medicating really, because it was getting rid of these horrible symptoms I had that were very distressing. You know, they affected my everyday, my work. I ended up working in TV in my early twenties and just uh, behind the scenes in the newsroom of a big TV station in Sydney. And I had to roll the auto cue for the speaker to follow the script and I'd shake. So every day I'd panic about having that job, um, even though I loved it because I love being in a studio. It wasn't actually in my job description, so I never knew if I was going to have to do it each day, and it just it was that constant fear. And I always managed to do it, and no one knew, but it, I sure could. Oh, it was awful. So just living with that stress and fear was very hard. So the drinking really just got rid of all that. You know, I just could numb out. So, so in my early years, it was weekends. It was just for partying. Dinner. That was it. And then I traveled overseas and as a 22, 23 year old, did two years over there and everyone drank. So I was no different. You know, I didn't stand out at this point, nor, and same in Australia, ever, all my friends were drinking. So nothing unusual. I was pregnant at 24 and that was easy to not drink. So I had my first daughter young, um, and I didn't drink for a while after I had her. And then the partying started again, not, not too often, maybe monthly or fortnightly. And then throughout the next fifth, well, 17 years, my, uh, I had two more kids and, and always managed just easily stop drinking while I was pregnant. But I always got back into it, you know, a year later or old whatever and still did the binging so still just went out on weekends or but it could be two or three nights in a row and then when my youngest who's he's now 14 when he was about one or two the mother's group we wanted to go out and um I remember one of the mothers saying oh we should practice drinking get back into it you know and she was just meaning she was just having a laugh she didn't drink much you know so she she probably didn't re well, she had no idea. I, I was thinking, yes, yes, I'm going to practice. And by practice, you know, I just actually opened a bottle and probably had two glasses. And at, but at the time, there was another woman in our group who was a drug and alcohol counselor. And she said, just be careful. That can lead to more. And I just brushed it off. But sure enough, I, um, I would have a glass or two at night. And then slowly, slowly over the next 10 years or a bit less, eight years, that increased. And I would have, and, and I'm not, not, it wasn't every night, but it would increase that when I did open that bottle of wine, I might have three glasses or four. So it, it did slowly increase over the years. And then when I initially stopped drinking in 2018, I was drinking like one to two bottles of wine a night. So it had very much increased and I wasn't going out because I wanted to just be by myself. I didn't drink in the day. I had a job. I parented well. So it was um, what you might hear as high functioning, you know, mm -hmm. um, that I am reluctant to say alcoholic. I, I feel like it Lots of things went wrong at the time. My marriage was breaking down and it was just self-medicating again. Um, but 
it. And so I stopped for four mo- five months then, but then I went back onto it and then COVID hit. And as we all know, COVID, I think, made or break a lot of people who drank. So it became easier for me. It, be- it, it became accepted. I don't know if you remember, Melissa, but the memes and things were like, there were tea, there were cups of coffee with a tea bag, but then it'd say like my daily vodka or something, you know, there were, and it just was everywhere on Facebook and that. And then, um, Zoom meetings. And I know that my friends and I had talked and say, oh, we should have a drink in the coffee mug, you know, just became more acceptable. I didn't drink through the day still, but I might've had one or two, which as we know, can increase over time. So I was aware not to you know, just to be, not go too far. Um, and I think then I was working from home and I mean, that's quite tricky when I work at a school with children with autism, but for a period of time, they were home as well. So it was online and, and then they didn't want to sit in the classroom online. So we had a lot of free time actually working from home. Um, and it got to about August in 2021. And I thought, no, this is, this is not going to end well. And my daughter was very angry at me. She was 14 at the time and she knew I was drinking in the lounge room at night and she'd text me from the bedroom. I hate you. You know, she was scared that I was drinking too much. So it wasn't a good situation. And I had split up with my husband at this point. So it got to a point and I thought this is just not going to end well. I need to stop this. So I looked online and that's where I found a course by Annie Grace and Annie Grace, anyone that's sort of given drinking a pause or, or stopped will probably know her because she's got a really successful book and company that help people take a break. So it was called the live alcohol experiment. I signed up September 21 and every morning, every day they'd have a coach on who would speak live. And one of them was Australian. And I thought that's what I want to do. Even though it was my beginning of the journey of stopping drinking, I knew I wanted to coach people to do the same because I think I've always known alcohol's played a big role in my life, but I wanted to learn how to get rid of it. It's been in my subconscious, I think. So, so once I did that course and stopped, I um, looked into the coaching and that began, I signed up. And that began at January, 2022 and 80 of us from around the world joined up and did that online together. And here I am, I'm, I certified through there. I started a podcast with a friend on that I met there and I haven't had a drink for 19 months. So yeah. Yay. Congratulations on your sobriety. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's, you know, I don't want to make it sound easy because it's not uh but it having that support and that community around me I I feel like it has been easy you know just having so many people doing the same thing and having something to look forward to you know our course our coaching my podcast so it certainly helped how's your relationship with your daughter now a lot better so she's actually doing the HSC that I spoke about, the leaving certificate, she's currently doing that now. And yeah, look, because there's, I have an older daughter who's 25. Then I have this particular daughter who's 17 and my son's 14. And it's just created a safer environment at home. I wanted them to feel home is the safe place and mum is the safe place. So that's definitely there for them. Yeah. So she's relaxed a lot and it was, she was worried and I don't blame her. Um, but yeah, I feel good that because their dad's not really in the picture, I've created the space and they know that they can call me anytime if they need me. Uh, home is where they can be themselves. No surprises. You know, I'm here and if anything, I'll just be apart from working, I'll be just on the lounge watching some Netflix. (laughs) They just know mum's mum's good now so yeah it's really good she's happy yeah what you've described seems like a really predictable process on one hand but also a very identifiable process on another 
uh, and I don't know that there's a specific place along that timeline where you s were, would be able to identify that this is when it became too much. Because sometimes people will have a drink to take the edge off and it doesn't go any further. And yeah. for other folks, it does go a lot further and it causes disruptions. But it would be difficult from what I hear in your story and from the stories of others to know that, okay, now I've gotten into a place that I've crossed some kind of line. So can you tell us a little bit about that and what that understanding is like for you? Yeah, and I think you're right. It's, there's nothing obvious that, you know, a person just suddenly goes, I've crossed that line. It's, I was sp speaking to someone the other day, and it's interesting because on, on one hand, it feels like everything happened really quickly, but suddenly you were drinking too much. Suddenly you were out, out of control. But on the other hand, it's a really slow build up. So it's an interesting thing because you don't really see it happening. Um, from a logical perspective, but subconsciously, I knew all along there was a problem with how much I drank. So I always talk about this niggle in the back of your head. And I think if you've got that, listen to it. But also saying that it's a journey and most people don't just stop. You know, there's a lot of stops and starts. There's a lot of what I would say is I did a lot of research and looking for other people, support groups. That's how I found this naked mind. I also found other things along the way, but just a curiosity, I guess, for me was there along the way. And just knowing that I always did drink too much. Now that's not going to happen for everyone. And I think it can, I can only really speak for myself, but I do know a lot of people who are like me will be big drinkers from the start. So I think if someone's sort of questioning, they might be able to see a pattern that, you know, I could never just have one. Um, but the other thing that's really important is if you're questioning your drink. So it doesn't even matter. I have clients who might only have a few drinks a week, but if they're thinking that's not right for them or they're feeling that they are performing 100% in their job or whatever, that's the same. You know, it's your how you feel about it. If that's a problem for you, reach out and find some help. And, and, and I don't mean a doctor or a, it doesn't have to be AA or anything like that. There's so many people that you can connect with. Even just, um, there are some online groups now that are everywhere, you know, meetup groups, people that don't drink, you know, just, um, start to broaden that circle so that you're not just doing drinking activities. Uh, but yeah, I definitely say it's when the voice in your head gets louder, it doesn't have to be that you're passing out drunk. Uh, just listen to that voice. And yeah, so for me, I can look back and know that that voice was always there, I think, but it started to become louder when my kids were older and they were commenting. I could kind of hide it until then. And then also I wasn't drinking at home. You know, I was just out partying a lot. And so when I came home, the kids didn't see that. But then as I started to just want to drink on my lounge at night, it became very obvious to them. And that was another warning sign to me. I didn't want to go and socialize because I couldn't drink as much as I wanted. Whereas at home I could. So, you know, so there's lots of red flags, but I think listen to the voice in your head and you'll get a bit of an idea of uh, how you're feeling about the situation and where you're at. And to me, that, that voice, that niggle, just wouldn't quieten. And so I started to listen. I love this because we do so much comparison when we're trying to figure out uh, and label something. Um, we don't have to be the falling down drunk to yeah. say that we have a problem. Or, and, you know, I think a lot of people that I have spoken to anyway struggle with this in that, well, I can't take services away from those who really need it because I'm not that. But if it's interfering with your life, you yeah. too need the services and you deserve 
to be served so that you can be whole and complete in your life. Or others will say, I feel so much shame because I didn't have this horrible experience that led me to drink. I don't even know why I started or how it began, but here I am. Either way, you deserve to be healthy and whole in your life. It's not just about how you stack up and your story stack up stacks up against okay. others. That's really irrelevant. It's yes. how your story stacks up with your values, your conscience, your your intuition, your spirit. And if that's disconnected, then it's time for you to seek help. And it's okay to seek help. Yes, absolutely. Like that is just so true. All of that. And I think you said it, everyone deserves help if they feel they need it. it. This is an addictive substance. So chances are it um, it will get worse. It, you're dealing with something that the idea behind it, well, there's, you know, alcohol does, you build a tolerance. And so you're going to want more. So it, you can't say that it won't get worse. Maybe it won't. But we're, we're dealing with a substance here, not, it's not your willpower. It's not being weak. This is a, an addiction to something that's, it, alcohol's a problem here. So everyone has a right to help. And I did go through that. I did go through the, but my trauma wasn't really very big. You know, yes, I had some anxiety, um, but my parents were great. You know, so there was that. I did have that cognitive dissonance where I didn't feel I had a right, um, but I have worked through that. And it, it traumas trauma in your brain. Our brains don't differentiate. And it, you know, there's so, that's what we do in the coaching. You, you know, I, there are clients that say, I'm just bored. And that's why I drink. But there's all, there is something below it. And a lot of it can come down to things like fear or not feeling worthy. And these are universal things that often are the, you know, the root of lots of issues. So working through that is just so incredible. And that's why I've come to this point and I am, you know, able to talk about this because I've worked on all those things. So like you said, learning, that just not comparing. Everyone's got different circumstances and it does not matter uh, in the over, in the scheme of things. What matters is that you've made, you're making a choice like you said, spiritually, health-wise, emotionally, to, um, you know, to get healthy, to, to live your authentic, true life. And to me, apart from my kids, I wanted to find my purpose and my passion. That was hugely important to me. I started to look at, what am I doing here? You know, I am not on earth to numb out and black out. That's that's not what I'm here for, you know, and I wanted to be healthy. I th I'm turning 50 this year. I think it, it's an age when you start to really think about, hold on, what's the next, you know, 50, hopefully, going to hold. Um, if I'm not at my best, I'm going to go downhill. So lots of things came into play for me, but I definitely want to be at my best. And, you know, giving up alcohol, I had some health issues that I'd been numbing out and I had to have some dentist dentist work, nothing major, but I had neglected my teeth because I never went to the dentist. So getting back into regular dentist routine is actually self-care. Yeah. And it, and then things like I had some, um, some leg pain, which is the fibromyalgia type thing, but I could cover it up. So I had to work through that, but I'm so glad I got to deal with these things because they would have got worse. Yeah. And absolutely. yeah. And so now I just, I just walk a lot and, um, try and I try to be healthy. Now I've given up alcohol, so I have sugar binges, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to beat myself up over that, but I just feel on top of everything. I'm giving myself a, at least the best chance for the rest of my life. Well, tell us real quick about your podcast. So I was very lucky to meet. In the course, there were majority were Americans and I've got some beautiful friends in America now. I feel like going over and visiting everyone. Um, and then there were some Australians. So there were five of us in the course and one of them 
Bella said to me, who wants to do a podcast? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I so want to do a podcast. Because even though I stopped, even though my um, anxiety to sort of stop me public speaking, it's, it's really what I want to do. So we dived headfirst into this podcast. Um, we've just had a name change of it. So it's called Not Drinking Today. We wanted to appeal to everyone um, and anyone that's interested in it. And we ha- have about 40 episodes now. And we interview all sorts of people, neuroscientists, authors, uh, health experts. I've had a few anxiety doctors. Um, the authors are, there's Quitlit out there for people that uh, don't know what Quitlit is, you know, awesome memoirs, sobriety memoirs. And, um, and then we have interviews with everyday people like myself who have triumphed over drinking. And yeah, it's just a really uplifting, very casual chat with Bella and I, you know, we keep it real. Uh, just, just to help people along the way. When you listen to a podcast like that, you are, you know, such a good way to start the, the journey of curiosity. Just um, changes the neural pathways. You, it's a positive look at, at sobriety. Um, it, it's, it's just such a good way to start that journey of curiosity, as is things on Instagram. I love to follow positive sobriety um, uh, Insta posts and there's so many more out there now, you know, the community is growing, the curious, sober curious movements growing. There's so much that you can reach out and see now, but the, yeah, look, our podcasts are about 40, 40 minutes long. They're, you know, whack it on when you go for a walk or in the car on your Bluetooth. Um, but yeah, we've, we've had some great guests and it's just, it, it is my passion. So I'm very excited to say I've, I found a purpose and passion and, um, yeah, so it's, it, it's really got me excited and helping me enjoy the sober life. I'm so glad to hear that. And the link to your website and, you know, if anyone is interested in reaching out to you or working with you or listening to your podcast, just click on the link to the website. In the show notes, there are links to follow Megan. And I know she has a generous heart and would love if anyone reached out to her. So please do that. Megan, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Melissa. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you.